Hey guys, this is Brian Townsend for Cardrunners.com. Um, here today, I'm going to be reviewing a session of 2550 No Limit Hold'em, uh, two tables, uh, table two and four. I'll number them. Uh, so here's table two, here's table four. Uh, table one was a 1020 table, and table three is a 510 table. Um, you guys sadly get the tops cut off because I have to do a second generation recording. Uh, for technical reasons, basically Camtasia froze as I did the whole video and saved it, which with voice narration, which is, as you could imagine, extremely annoying. So this will be my second time through, so it'll be a much, much more in-depth and better analysis than before. Okay, so starting off with uh, <clears throat> some player reads. Um, in the lower right, we have a really tough table that's going to break down here really quick and end up just heads up between your endanger and I. Uh, pretty much the only reason these 2550 games run anymore is because of one weak player um, and uh, you know so my, I guess my reads on these guys you're not in danger is a really good player um, I played some PLO with him and a little bit of no limit to hold him so I have a pretty good read on him but for the purpose of this video just you know he's a good solid tag player um, I'm sure first hand comes up on the lower right. Roland the Trout is Trault, or however you say it. It's also a really good player, probably one of the better 1020, if not the best 1020 reg, uh, and also plays 2550, and even bigger when it runs, um, though it doesn't run that much anymore. Um, on the upper right, uh, so a weak player just got busted from table four, and that's why the game is broken down between us, and uh, the game's going to break here pretty quickly and end up just heads up between you're not in danger and I. Um, on the upper right, it's a really solid table as well. John Buttons is Raptor's friend. Uh, we met once in Florida for a CR thing and he did a video with Raptor. A uh, really good 2-4, um, like a mid-stakes player. Um, super successful there. So, um, you know, I think this is a little bigger game for him. So, kind of counterintuitively, when people play at bigger games, I find them more likely to do kind of random, spazzy, crazy bluffs and also more likely to um, to be um, to make be making like like not not be willing to fold hands. So like um, you know people who I see as shot takers, I never try to bluff because I feel like they always think they're being run over. When in actuality, you know that's usually the farthest thing from the case. Um, but I feel like. Um, like they are getting run out, or they feel like they're getting run over. So generally, I try not to bluff him. So I'm not going to be bluffing John Buttons much. Uh, we actually don't play that much, and um, I'm going to try to play pretty straightforward against him and realize that he's going to look to make a lot of moves on me, or I, th or so I think he will. Uh, you know, obviously each person's different, but this is kind of just my general rule for when I see people taking shots at bigger games and bigger limits. Um, some of the other players, Time KPR is a multi-tabler. Uh, I don't think he's a reg. I've never seen him before today, but he seemed like a decent player. Um, Larghetto, I think I'd heard about. Uh, I think he's from the Euro sites. Uh, seems like a solid player. Paggio, I'd never played with. He's from Italy. Um, so I kind of took that to mean he was probably weaker, but I had no reads on him. Um, on table one here, Extreme Shock was multi-tabling. I thought he was probably okay. And BRS23 was uh, a guy who kind of came out of the woodwork for some weaker players. Um, and uh, I didn't have much of a read on Iatros, but he seemed a little bit loose and passive, so I took that into account. Maybe he doesn't play as much poker as some of the other guys. Um, table four, uh, pretty much everybody seemed like a solid player, except for lots of douche, dosh, um, I guess not douche. <laughs> and uh, I didn't have a good read on him, but uh, because he wasn't buying in full, I thought that he probably was a little weaker. So here I open a uh, king three offsuit. Standard open on the button, I think, or, you know, the bottom of my range, but still fine to open. And you're not in danger to flats. Now, here when he flats, I never really think he's flatting. I mean, occasionally he's flatting aces or kings here, but for the most part, his flatting range is... Is going to be pretty weak, um, and not necessarily weak hands. You know, he'll have a lot of like 
big high card hands that he doesn't want a three bet and face a four bet with. So a lot of hands like ace jack, possibly even ace queen, though I think he's the type of player who isn't going to polarize his range that much. Um, but I think a lot of like king 10 off suit, jack 10 off suit, queen jack, um, those types of hands I think he's going to flat call my button raise with. Um, and again, if he has a bigger hand, I think he's just going to go ahead and re-raise. So now um, I flop a decently strong draw on a queen jack 10 with a spade board. Um, the reason why I see bet, and I don't necessarily think see betting is mandatory, was, um, you know, there's, I, f I felt like I was rarely getting raised. I mean, sure, there are some like king nine suited is in his range, nine eight suited. Uh, that I felt like he would raise with, but I felt like a lot of other hands he would just check call. You know, things like queen jack, well, queen jack he might go ahead and raise, uh, but things like jack 10 and queen 10, I felt like, although he wouldn't think he didn't have the best hand, he might think he would extract more value with those hands uh, by just going ahead and check calling. So, um, those were kind of the hands that I put him on. Also, on the flop, I think he floats with any 9. You know, if he has like 9-7, I think he check calls the flop. Um, so that was kind of the range of hands that I kind of saw him having. Um, also, a lot of things like ace-10, king-10, jack-9, 10-9, you know, queen-9 suited type of hands as well. So, um, And again, I don't think a flop bet is mandatory, but, but I think it's fine. Um... You know, as I don't see getting check raised all that much, and when I do, I'd have to fold. Um, so now the turn, I go ahead and I bet again. Now the reason for this was, um, you know, there's a lot of hands. One, I have some non-zero equity, and uh, assuming he doesn't have queen jack or jack ten now, um, but I felt like there was there were enough hands in his range that were weak enough, you know, things like a random nine, things like another, you know, if he, there aren't too many ki suited kings he would play that wouldn't have a pair, but I also set up for some nice river bluffs, um, you know, but hands like even ace high he might float with, if he's got a hand like ace nine, um, he's going to peel the flop with, even something as weak as maybe ace eight, he'd just check call, see what I do, so I felt like there were a lot of, though probably not with that weak of an ace, but definitely with ace nine, ace ten, ace jack, uh, even if you flat it with ace queen, he's going to be check calling though. He's probably not going to fold to a turn bet with any of those, but ace ten. Um, but I felt up it set. You know, one, I was getting a good discount on my equity. Two, if I got check raised on the turn, one, I would rarely think it's a bluff because I would imagine it being a lot of jack ten and queen jack. So if I got raised, it's not the end of the world folding as I have no equity. And there, there are a lot of hands that I can bluff on the turn and also set up a nice river bluff. Um, so that's why I opted to go ahead and bet. Um, I think on the turn he would fold a lot of his nines. So now when the river rolls off a nine, um, I think there's very few nines in his range unless it's specifically hands like um, king nine, which you know I was drawing pretty slim against the entire time, which opted not to raise the flop, and then you know just check called the turn. Uh, so king nine. Uh, jack nine is a hand that I could definitely see him having. Maybe nine ten though he might fold the turn with that, but I could see him having nine ten. Um, maybe queen nine, but even that I don't know if he plays preflop unless it's suited. So, so there's a lot, and even a lot of those hands he might just go ahead and three bet me with. So, there aren't all that many nines in his range, and sure I do I could see him showing up here with like queen jack jack ten. But I also see a lot of his range being like king queen, ace ten, king ten, even a hand like king jack. I think he could consider folding on this river. And the reason is a hand like king jack or ace jack it has the exact same strength as a hand like ace ten. So, you know, there's no real. Um, and he's a really good player, and he's going to realize that. He's going to know that if he's calling with a ten. You know, calling with a jack is the same as calling with a 10. So I actually do have some decent fold equity against, like, king jack or ace jack, I think. Though I think, naturally, people are just more inclined to call when they have a stronger range, even though it's, um, even though the board texture doesn't matter. But, uh, yeah, so that's why I opted to go ahead and uh, fire the river there, because I felt like um, there were enough of those hands that were kind of doing the, Oh, I'm going to appeal the turn because I still have some equity, you know, like ace-10, king-10, and I'm going to see what if he gives up on the river, you know, expecting me to give up with something like a random king or whatever on the river. So um, that's why I opted to uh, fire three barrels there.
and here we see Roland uh, sitting out. Um, and I play heads up with you're not in danger for a little bit. And I think my last video I actually played him heads up for a bit too. He plays quite a bit, and I have a you know a decent idea of how he plays um, just based off playing um, some PLO with him. Um, you know he's a guy who who's very aggressive pre-flop. He's gonna barrel lightly um, and just you know generally be a hard guy to play against. So um, not a guy that I would look to play heads up. Uh, for any extended period of time, but uh, you know, it's definitely worth keep playing too. Is there's a lot of people and there's a lot of incentive, as you can see later. Uh, a weaker player comes and sits, so even though you know you're probably only slightly plus EV versus a player, or even neutral or a slight dog versus him, uh, there's still a lot of value in just playing him and keeping games going, and that's something that I see a lot of people not doing very well. Um, you know, like at this table, table four, once the weak player got busted here, everybody instantly sat out and nobody wanted to play, which is, you know, which is really bad just in general for the poker games because, as you can see, in about five minutes after you're not in danger and I are playing heads up, some really weak player comes. So here on table one, uh, Extreme Shock limps. He'd been limping a bit, but uh, at the time I didn't know that, and... I'm not going to raise 9-4 offsuit there uh, until I have a stronger idea of what he's doing that with. Um, the turn, I just go ahead and fold. I could peel one more. I think, you know, I didn't realize how little he bet, uh, so I would have liked to have seen a turn peel there, but uh, folding is obviously fine. Uh, on <clears throat> table four, um, excuse me, I have uh, water. I'm sick today, so I'm drinking some water from here and there. Uh, table four, I, fl I see bet the flop. Uh, I don't actually love my flop C bet. I think King ten five with a suit it hits a lot of his range. Um, you know, a lot of his flatting range I see just being like Ace ten. You know, like Jack nine is even gonna have a gutter and float, and just a lot of hands like with kings in it. You know, like the big unsuited non uh, uh, unsuited kings like King Jack, King Queen, King ten, King nine, even this deep. I think he's just gonna flat with all those hands pre flop. So I think there's a lot of incentive uh, to be checking that flop. But now that I did bet the flop, uh, the turn is just an auto barrel, in my opinion, for obvious reasons. Um, you know, there's so many strong hands that I can have, even though a lot of my range is air. Um, there's so many strong hands that I do have in my range, and there's so many weak tens and things that he's going to have to fold that I think barreling that turn is, is just standard. Um, here's a great spot with pocket kings with a lot of action in front. Uh, I put in a large re-raise here. And a player who at the time I didn't have any read on, um, and still don't have a great read on him, but uh, um, I noticed this player, Tristero, was very aggressive and isolating often. Um, so this would have been a play I would have made with an airy type hand too. Um, now Mufasa thinks for a bit and actually goes ahead and calls. Now when he calls, I don't think this deep he's got something like aces, the other kings or queens in his slow playing. Uh, I kind of put his range on a lot of hands like ace-queen, ace-jack, ace-ten, suited, um, those types of things, and also small pairs. So obviously on this board texture with these stack sizes, there's no reason to bet that much. I could even have bet a little bit less, even like 200. Or whatever there's just you know it sets up better turn and river shoves um, so there I, I'm guessing he folded something like ace queen or ace ten suited or whatever else he may have called with maybe he had a suited connector in this deep wanted to see you know if he could flop something so I think it's uh, you know it's just good to even when he does fold to kind of put together his range and what he's doing with what hands Um, here on the lower right, I bet the flop with my gutter. Uh, I think checking back and calling a turn bet would have been perfectly reasonable as well, especially against an aggressive player. Um, and now on the river, um, kind of a scary card comes in, but actually it's not really that scary of a card in that uh, 
you know, it doesn't really hit much of his range, and I actually should have just gone ahead here and bet the river. Uh, it's kind of tough because I don't see him calling. I think a lot of his check calling on the turn range, even though I hold an ace, is a lot of ace high type hands, but also things like 4 5 and 3 4 and things like that. But I, I would have preferred to just go ahead and bet the river and fold to a check raise because if he does check raise the river, you know, he's obviously um, check raising me with some type of hand which has showdown value after check calling two streets and every draw gets in and although it might not have any relative value in calling um you know he does have to be turning a made hand into a bluff and generally i'm not too worried about people doing that against me you know when people have to turn a made hand into a bluff i usually give them credit for having a hand or repping so i at the time i just i don't know why i just kind of had a brain fart or whatever and froze up but this is it would be a pretty clear bet on the river there, even with results aside. You know, I think there's a lot of those aces in his hands, and you know, I could even, I'm probably not going to get too much value from him, but it's worth doing. Um, so here on the upper right, I check call the flop with pocket sixes, and you know, pre flop I think is standard against a guy who I view as willing to make a lot of moves against me and things like that. Um, and now on the river here when I get raised, you know, basically he's wrapping pocket fives, ace three or six three. Uh, I don't think he's slow playing a hand on the turn that much. Um, so, you know, against the guy who's a shot taker, I find they're much more willing to make these moves and things. And maybe my read's totally off on him. Maybe he's moved up in the last year and, um, you know, is... Uh, and is, um, you know, not necessarily making moves. But I kind of felt like this was a bigger game for him to be more inclined to make moves. So I went ahead here and called. Um, and he did have a hand that I thought he might play this way, ace three. Um, I don't hate my call, and I think it's perfectly uh, legitimate to call here. Um, You know, that said then, I do have a made hand there a lot, so, um, you know, I think my play is fine. Now here on the lower right is a play I really hate um, on table four. I think calling a re-raise with pocket threes and floating this flop against a guy like you're not in danger, who I know is just going to barrel like crazy, and I'm actually surprised he didn't barrel ace-queen here, because I know I've seen him barrel it a lot. Um, it's just not going to be a profitable play, um, and generally that... You know, trying to show down those threes there against a guy like this. He, he's just too good, quite frankly. He's just going to bet too much and, and make it really unprofitable. So um, I think that was definitely a losing flop call. I think pre-flop is fine, um, but definitely on the flop, I should have uh, just folded to his bet. Um, even on a board that misses a lot of his range like that, just because I do think he's going to be barreling a lot. Now here, um, basically I just check raise here, just... For balance, um, you know, I think check calling is fine, but when you just start check calling with all your like medium strength draws, I think it it allows you to it allows him to play well against you on future streets. And there's just no reason to let a hand like Jack Ten or whatever uh, gain their equity and spike a river a Jack or a Ten or let him just barrel with a bunch of hands. So. Uh, I opted to go ahead and check raise there, feeling that I wouldn't get three that too often, and when I did, I could fold against what would presumably be a lot of bigger flush draws and stuff, and I would have enough strong flush draws in my range that I'd be shoving with that I don't have to worry about, um, you know, him bluff three betting profitably there, plus I'll have enough value hands. Um, extreme shock bets, you know, less than a half pot. Obviously, I'm not folding ace high. Uh, on the lower right, I check call with my weak draw, just my gutter. And um, I turn a queen, and I think, again, there's no real other play than just to call the turn uh, with these stack sizes. I think raising is, is pretty bad. Um, and then on the river... Um, he goes ahead and bets like three quarters pot. And I didn't really think he was bluffing here very much. And I actually talked myself into a call. And in hindsight, I really don't like a call. I thought that he would be value betting ace 10 and king 10. 
And although he might, I don't think it makes up enough of his range to call, just because I don't feel like he's just barreling off on this board for some reason. I don't know why. I can't really articulate it very well, but um, I just didn't feel like he'd be he'd be bluffing here much. And you can see I waver over fold and then decide to call. And and I think this is a losing play here. Um, I think I should have found a river fold, and I'm not real happy. Even even results aside, I'm not I'm not real happy with my river call. Um, sure, his range is wide, but on that board, I just don't think he's value betting worse often enough for me to call, and I don't think he's bluffing enough. Um, though that's a tough situation to tell, and um, you know maybe he is, and I'm just not realizing it. But I, I think I could have found a river fold there. Um, here on this board with Ace High, I opt just to give up. Um, I think a lot of his flatting range is going to have either a 10, a 9, an 8, a Jack, or a Queen. So it's going to require multiple barrels to get him off. And I just did not feel like going ahead and um, barreling. So here, Cookie Sniper sits down, player I'd never seen. But all of a sudden, out of the word work come the Bum Hunters. And, um, you know, it's pretty clear who the weak player is at this table. Um, so that's always nice. And this just goes to show why me playing You're in Danger 2, heads up, who, um, and here I'm making a note. That's kind of rude of me, I guess, but, um, <clears throat> you know, me playing You're in Danger, heads up, is probably a neutral proposition, um, or, you know, not a great spot, not a great way to be spending my time, but if you get weaker players to come out to play, it's well, well worth it. And that's one reason to keep games kind of running, at least for a little while even. Um, here with nines, no other play. Though it is interesting to note that Kristen 1971 was re-raising and folding. Um, and does go ahead and fold here, even with amazing odds. Um, generally as a short stacker, I think... Uh, re-raises should be infrequent um, with a 50 big blind stack. I don't think you should be re-raising folding. I think you should just be turning a wide range into a semi-bluff. You know, things like queen-jack suited um, is probably fine to just overship with 50 big blinds and you'll show a profit, but I think raise folding those is kind of bad. Um, here, again, another easy shove against a 50 big blind stack, and I get it in good against ace-10 and hold. As you can see, I know all the hands since I just did this video earlier today when it uh, when it froze on me. And I'll tell you, if you ever make videos, there's nothing worse than finishing a video and being like, okay, it's pretty good, you know, I'm good, nice video, and then it freezes on you. It's pretty aggravating, particularly on New Year's Eve. So, um, <clears throat> Here I'm making a note on Port Tom. Uh, never played with him, but supposedly he's a good player. Um, don't really have much info on him. And interesting to note that uh, Kristen left without even taking the free hand. Um, you know, that's, I guess, true true bum hunter there, you know, sitting and playing only when a weak player and then instantly leaving, not even taking your free hand because you're so afraid of other players, I guess. I don't know. I don't know what the case is, but, uh, you know, it seems like kind of bad business on Christian's part by being that much of a bun hunter. And don't get me wrong, like, I'm all about about playing people and, you know, not playing people better than you. Like, I don't think you should, but I think you can wait a round or two so the person who just left the table, who is presumably the fish, uh, doesn't see you just instantly leaving right when they leave. I mean, I guess against some people it's fine who don't care and realize they're a fish, but as a general strategy, if you don't know that person, I think you should wait a few rounds. Um, but, you know, people are going to do what they're going to do. And, again, no disrespect to Cookie Sniper. I have no idea how good this person is. I just presumed everything off the fact that, you know, 
this person sits down and all of a sudden out of the woodwork comes this coolness guy or Kristen person or whoever else it may be. Uh, here on the lower left hand table we have a pretty interesting hand. Um, also it's a very good sign when a player sits down with 50 big blinds on table 4 and then uh, and then buys in with even more. Uh, usually I find it's somebody trying to chase the losses a little bit. So whenever I see a player, you know, who's kind of like a shot taker or kind of gambling it up, buy in for like 50 big blinds and come back and buy in for a little more than that, usually they're trying to double up and win back what they lost. So it's a really good spot. Uh, actually here after the poster against John Buttons, I wish I had re-raised that ace-10 suited. Uh, I think I was just kind of playing a lot of tables and not paying attention to what was going on. Uh, I think that's a pretty clear re-raise because he's going to be isolating that so uh, wide. Here on table three, um, you know, obviously a monster hand and a good flop for me. Um, going to be c-betting this. On table one here, I wish I hadn't c-bet this. At the time, I didn't realize how aggressive fold to cash was because um, I'd only played 30 hands with him. And generally, I'm going to check back things like my gutters or else I'm going to call and float with things like my gutters against aggressive players but i was just unaware how uh how aggro he was um here you know i'm obviously getting the money in uh even with these even being as deep as we are there's just no reason not to be getting the money in um i could three bet the flop i think there's some merit to that but generally with position i think flatting is better out of position i think you have to go ahead and three bet the flop um but in position, I think you can peel. Um, here with King Jack offsuit, yeah, he's re-raising worse, but with 200 and almost 50 blinds, you just you just absolutely cannot play King Jack offsuit there. Uh, even if you do have equity over his range, you're just going to get uh, destroyed out of position there. Um, so here I go ahead and I bet real small on table three. Basically, this is. Um, what I would do if I had a hand like Jack-10 or Queen-Jack or any of those types of hands that uh, I had floated the flop with, you know, a hand like Queen-Jack that I'd be bet folding the turn with. Um, here at Table 1, I re-raised Ace-Jack suited, uh, checked the flop, checked called the turn. Um, and at the time, I didn't know much about him. Uh, so here, you know, TD kind of makes a fancy play syndrome with nines. Um, I think his check raise on the flop and check the turn is okay uh although i think i prefer a lead actually um i think against me the optimum line would be lead turn check river um and the reason for that is um if i i think leading the turn small still is going to induce floats out of me out of like jack 10 or queen jack and when he checks the river, I'm going to bluff 100% of the time. So I think his uh, his line does extract value from Queen Jack and Jack 10, but I think he might extract more value from those hands if he were just to check call the turn, um, or if he were to lead the turn small and check the river. I think that would be the optimum line against me. So here, you know, I I'm not sure what type of player is if he's just like kind of overly fancy play syndrome or what, but, uh, you know, any way you play this, the, the stacks are going in. Uh, I'm never going to be folding kings on that board, um, particularly on that turn. So, um, you know, it, it's tough to tell what type of player he is, but uh, he could be a little overly tricky trappy. Here on table two, um, you know, just, just there's just no reason to be doing anything other than bet, bet, betting. Um, here on table one, I actually, I went ahead and I folded the river. Um, the reason for that was I felt a lot of his check back the flop range would include kings. And if he did have something like just a random queen or a random 10, he would bet the flop. Um, so I went ahead and folded, but in hindsight, he's really aggro and I wouldn't have minded a call there. Uh, here on table four, I just misclicked. I should be c-betting that into those two opponents 100% of the time. I just had a lot of other action going on. Uh, I should never be checking that against a player like Cookie Sniper and then somebody who's a bum hunter. I should just be bet, bet, betting and even barreling off it's coolness to get him off a of jack.
Um, here on table one, I'm starting to notice how aggressive fold to cash is. So I just go ahead and put in a three bet or a four bet. I actually don't like this four bet in that I find the first time you four bet people, they think you're making a move a lot of the time. Uh, so I would have, I think, you know, it worked out and I got a fold, but I don't really like my play. And I think I played that poorly and should have just, uh, should have just folded preflop. Um, though he did insta fold here, just hoping to check down fives. Um, and he's willing to give up with a hand like queen four, which which is fine. It it beats enough of my like low range. Um, here again, I still hadn't realized how, quite how aggro he was, uh, so I went ahead and see bet this flop with my non nut gutter. But in hindsight, I would have preferred not to, or if I had see bet it, I would have liked to have floated, uh, just because we are deep. But once I get check raised. Uh, without knowing too much about him. There's not much I can do. But as you see over the session, he stays really, really aggro. And he's somebody who you got to fight back against. Uh, here on table two. Our uh, player from Italy re-raises. Um, when you're not in danger, peels to a less than half size bet. I think his range includes an ace, pretty much any pair, uh, four five, three four. If he calls with a pre, which I'm not sure about, and any flush draw, um, plus some random floats, you know, like queen jack or whatever that he's looking to see what uh, this opponent does on the turn. Um, so here that I uh, fold to cash appears aggro, um, I opt to pot control with second pair and a gutter, um, which I think is fine, though I think I should go ahead and bet the turn. And the main reason is I think I'm going to induce a lot of uh, a lot of check raises. So there I'm guessing Paggio folded, because um, he's never going to think I have like a 6 or a 3-5 or anything big. So um, just worth noting. Also worth noting that he flats jack 10 offsuit pre. Uh, so there, Paggio folds the river. I'm guessing he had like queens through kings or something that check called the turn, folded the river. I'm not entirely sure. Um, here against Cookie Snipe, Sniper, I just check back the flop for pot control. Uh, when he or she bets almost full pot on the river, I actually think this is a pretty easy fold here. Um, here on table two, um, or table three, uh, I call a re-raise from Port Tom, who I assumed was a really good player. And with these stack sizes, I was kind of surprised to see a hand like 9-9. Um, you know, against a lot of players, I would just shove the turn. Uh, but against him, I kind of thought he would have a more polarized range and that my hand might be best a lot of the time because uh, he half-potted flop and turn. Um, so I didn't go ahead and shove. Um, but in hindsight, now knowing what I do know about him and knowing that he'll try to go for value on two streets with nines, uh, I think I do need to shove. And um, yeah, so just more info on him now. I would definitely play that hand differently in the future. Uh, here, I think I'm fine folding that uh, ace 10. Even though I did get bluffed, I'll need to. I hopefully I made a note of that. I don't think I did because. Um, because. Um, I was focused on this Port Tom hand, but watching this again, this is a good reason why I tape a lot of sessions and review them later, because you see things like that where I totally missed it at the time, but uh, you know it's a spot where I need to be um, 
I need to be taking a note on the player. Um, so here I'm just taking a note, and because of that note, I missed the note that I made on Cookies, or wanted to make on Cookie Sniper, that he was willing to bet near full pot as a bluff. Uh, normally I find uh, near full pot bets not to be bluffs. Um, here on the left-hand table, standard check call with ace jack. Um, and I go ahead and hero call the river, probably a little bit out of frustration, just because I felt like he wouldn't have a king that much because a lot of kings he would see bet the flop with. Um, but it looks like he was pot controlling with that king, so uh, I just make a note of that and use that for future reference. And I think his check is very good there. You know, I think both betting and checking are, are perfectly acceptable there, depending on how many folds he thinks he's going to get on that flop. Uh, interesting to see TD flat there with only a little over a pot size bet left. Um, I would imagine this would be a big hand a lot of the time. Um, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, which is not surprising. That's how I would have expected him to play aces. I actually didn't remember that hand. Um, and his opponent was making a bluff with king eight suited. So just interesting to note. Um, here on table one, I decided that I was going to go for three streets of value. Um, so I bet the flop. Well, obviously, I wasn't going for three streets of value when I got check called on the flop. Um, And then on the river, he leads for nearly half pot, and I did not know what this bet, bet meant at all. Um, I didn't think he was like going for value with fives or sixes, and I guess I wish I had just called just mainly for information to kind of put together what he does, uh, but I went ahead and folded for some reason. I see, like, looking back on it now, a lot of, like, ace fives in his range, or five sixes even, uh, five six, though I think he might have semi-bluffed the turn with those some of those hands. Um... So yeah, I, I wish I had called that one in hindsight. Um, here on table four, uh, pretty standard re-raise with kings. Um, and although it's a bit transparent, I can definitely balance here a lot of different ways. Uh, but with no real history, uh, I just go ahead and decide to check the flop. I could definitely bet, but... Um, But I think checking is good overall, and I'd be doing that with a lot of different hands. Um, and when he goes ahead and bets the turn, there's no real reason to continue. Um, you know, I could consider calling down, but I think he's a good enough player and value betting thin enough that I don't really need to worry about it. I think he's going for three streets of value with ace-queen once I check like that. So I think just going ahead and folding is definitely the optimum one. Uh, it's unfortunate, but, uh, you know, and maybe I take a different action next time, but uh, generally I think that's my standard line there with an underpair on an ace high board uh, against somebody who's not too particularly crazy. And, you know, I have enough other, like, weaker aces in my range there, things like ace jack that I'm doing that with that I don't really need to worry about getting barreled, plus the hands that I'm opting to slow play with. Uh, here on table two, I make a thin under-the-gun call. Uh, with 5-7 suited, um, you know, definitely 
a marginal call, but with these stack sizes, I felt like I could play it effectively. Um, and when I get C-bet on this real draw-heavy board, I just opt to go ahead and fold my hand. Um, just because I felt like he's going to put me on a lot of hands that I have if I do peel. A lot of things like gutters, straight draws, weak flush draws. Um, and he's just going to barrel lightly, and he's not going to give up easily. So I just opt to go ahead and fold bottom pair there. Um, I could have definitely peeled in position, but I would have much preferred peeling with like even a backdoor flush draw or something. If the board was monotone, I would much rather float with that, but floating with bottom pair on draw-heavy boards just gets you barreled and called down lightly, and you're not going to be able to play it that well. Um, and I just don't, I think definitely um, the way I played it is optimum. Of just folding the flop there with such a marginal hand. Um, here with Ace-10, I flat pre-flop, and I get a great flop for my hand. I opt to check-raise, mainly because I don't want to just be check-raising these boards with sets or air. So I think, you know, adding in things like Ace-10 there uh, is really good for my range, and uh, I actually don't think I would have gotten stacks in unless I was the one betting. But if you'd put in a raise at some point, I probably would have just folded, but I would have, like, bet, bet, bet against getting him to call me down with a 10 or a 5 or something that just thought I had air there a lot. So, that was kind of my reasoning for that. Um, here I see bet a really dry flop, uh, <clears throat> and I would have liked to have seen a turn bet there out of myself, or actually, let me just double check, I didn't quite follow that action. Yeah, um, I go ahead and I just see better really dry flop. I think when the ace turns, I felt like this was a guy that wouldn't give me much credit, particularly on the ace turn, but I think there's enough weak, and I didn't think he was floating, so I almost always thought he had a pair, either threes through sevens or a pair of eights. Um, and I definitely could have barreled the ace, but having the nut non-high card, even though it's not good ever, um, you know, against a hand like 9-10 or Jack-10, it's good. And although I don't think he'd let me show those down, he might. So um, I would have liked to have put in a turn barrel there, even though it is a bit transparent. Uh, I definitely think I should have put in a second bet somewhere. And it looks like my uh, video is chopping here a bit. Um, here when Cookie limps, uh, you know, I think I have a very easy isolate with pocket aids here. Uh, against stronger players, uh, I wouldn't. Um, and here's a really... A really tough spot now out of position against you're not in danger too um, I would presume here he has a pretty strong range as I don't see him opening uh, much when I raise from the small blind but that said out of position calling 550 more I just don't think I'm gonna be able to play it profitably like I'm sure I have equity against his range but he's just gonna be you know C betting so much and eights are just so hard to play out of position there that I opt to just fold it preflop uh, definitely would have called with nines, and maybe even folding eights there is a bit nitty, but um, it's just out of position, it's going to be a nightmare to play. In position, I would de happily go ahead there and flat, but uh, not having position is going to make it really, really difficult. Uh, here I flat with king-queen offsuit to a cutoff raise. Uh, I think re-raising is fine against certain players, but uh, generally, um, I think flatting is going to be the best line to take there. And I go ahead and see bet the flop. And turn the nuts. And just bet, bet, bet to get stacks in. Um, here on the turn, I could have bet a little bit less, like 180. Um, so 
Uh, actually, no, I like my bet sizing because I want to set up a nice river bet. And uh, although the video skipped there, uh, he called me with Queen Jack. So a uh, pretty thin call on the river by him and that, you know, all he beats there is a bluff. Um, but definitely not terrible by any means. But, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to construct a hand that I'm turning into a bluff there that has actually no showdown value. So, um, so I'm going to pause the video here and... Next week, I'm going to bring you part two of this. I play a huge pot uh, in the upcoming minutes with full to cash um, where I have a pair of aces, and it's a pretty interesting spot. So you guys will definitely enjoy that next week. Um, this was Brian Townsend for CardRunners.com.